Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to the Alpha Podcast with me, Frank, Ian Hand, and we welcome back Shane Martin. What's the crack? How is Who's that? <laughs> yeah, he's back. He's back. I'm a casual, casual <laughs> guest. Yeah, he's actually, uh, this week this he's podcast. actually our guest. Um, well, first of all, I'm just uh, happy to be back. And second of all, I just wanted to say that I don't appreciate um, telling everyone my business when I'm when I'm not around, Frank. There's always some I'm... arse or elbow with you and I, yeah. Oh, what am I supposed to say? Yeah, Sh- Shane's not bothered being here. You know, like... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I just would rather there be a bit of mystery. Mystery in this day and age, it just leads to people thinking the worst. If I go, Shane's not yeah. here this week, people will go, he's got piles or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'd be actually that'd be far worse I, I i see where you're coming from but anyway onwards this week is a podcast we've actually been talking about doing among ourselves for a long time that is formats music formats and audio formats and how we consume music because realistically we're all music nerds and um, you can't be a music nerd really without consuming it in some preferred way or all the ways. So basically the reason we are music nerds is true how we grew up listening to it, which was in my case tapes and CDs and vinyl were always there in the background. But we are of the age where we kind of experienced the beginning of streaming then as well. So we kind of, we're at that kind of strange generation maybe of like, millennials or whatever that have actually consumed all the formats almost in our lifetime it's actually a weird stat i came across when spotify do their stats about like you know uh, they break it into the age groups and stuff like that the people who listen to the most music are millennials and uh, people who were born between like 1984 and uh, 1994 and i think that is because we started off listening to music on cd so going back to what we spoke about last week with albums we're very connected to like the likes of the album i just i honestly think that we're probably the most into music nearly out of all the generations just because we experienced so many different formats and went through that the trials and tribulations to listen taping off the radio and making burn cds and all these sorts of things where people slightly older than us just were stuck listening to vinyl or gave up on cd whereas we have kind of fought through it all so yeah i think we're of good authority to talk about formats also just exactly just before we start just a bit of a word about like what the hell is a format like a music format is basically anything except the musician playing in front of you it's any recorded means of audio which i was kind of funny that right now with streaming we think that the artist is getting like this raw deal but if you kind of think about it an artist will always get the raw deal as long as there is music formats around because Once an artist records a piece of music, maybe once, which there is a lot of artists like Robert Johnson and all these people, it sets them in stone for the future. So that's one massively good side of audio formats. But one bad side is inevitably once you record something, you kind of make the artist a bit redundant because then you can just enjoy the recording forever. And the artist will constantly be going to catch up with that because it can be just shared around in so many different ways and the artist could be dead for all you know. Yeah, that's my little introduction on formats. Ian has definitely looked into it the most out of all of us because I think Ian definitely knows the most technically about all of this. So I'm going to pass the <laughs> baton to Mr. Ian Hand there. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Um, well, obviously, yeah, like, I mean, there's an absolute ton of formats out there and you're dead right in saying that we really are the first generation out of anyone previous to us that we have experienced nearly all of them, you know, and even now as we speak in 2021, we can practically still get all of them, you know, and um, some of them might have fallen out of popularity, but it can still be purchased, you know? So uh, what I kind of decided to do here was look at the kind of main uh, formats that kind of would have stood the test of time throughout the decades um, in their various kind of senates and then their falls and perhaps back again with the resurgence of vinyl and that. What I've looked at really is vinyl, uh, then onto cassette, then our beloved CD. Was, was it beloved? Was it? We'll see. Uh, <laughs> then the, the MP3, the dreaded MP3. 
And finally, then kind of a note on the modern streaming. And I know yourselves uh, have a little bit to say on the kind of digital and streaming end. So I won't go too far into that rabbit hole. I'll focus a little bit more on the the physical uh, formats. So really, yeah, look, if we start with vinyl, I mean, they were, you know, they they were originally made for playback. Uh, This is obviously after the wax cylinder, you know, we're talking. So the first kind of commercial attempt to sell vinyl, as we know it, the 12 inch um, was actually right smack during the Great Depression. <laughs> you know, so commercially, it was a complete flop, you know, at first, you know, because it's just people are very wary. They had no disposable income, you know, really to go and buy these things. And also the actual playback of vinyl back then, like, you know, the uh, turntables, or gramophones back then, you know, you, they just weren't affordable, you know, and they weren't being produced on mass either for households. So, it was it was a very brand new thing and not a lot of people could afford it or didn't really know what it was and they're quite wary of it, you know. Kind of rolled on then after the Great Depression. Really, you're looking at World War Two with the advancements of technology and you know what they say about war, like technology and, you know, everything in technology, medicine, production, you name it, ramps up tenfold and inventions and necessity, all that. So a great thing to come out of World War Two was obviously uh, Im- improvements on the production of vinyl and uh, turntables and making it commercially um, viable then, you know, for uh, the actual home use of listening to vinyl. So really you're talking about 1948 was when it started to become actually viable, you know, where, where people could listen to their LPs at home. And uh, of course, you have to mention Columbia here the Columbia Recording Company, which they enjoyed, you know, for a reasonable period of a year or two with no real competition. But then RCA come in. This is when you start getting the war of the speeds between 48 and 50. So you have the 33 and a third RPM uh, revolutions. Uh, the, 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 this is for our LP, our long play, which is where essentially you have your album. But the 45 was on a seven inch. So uh, what we would know now as singles, really. And now I, I'll touch on this uh, in a little bit about the difference between 45 and 33. But just for the moment, it was war the speeds. And they kind of settled into their niches where 45s became singles. And the 33 and a third 12 inch became, you know, better for albums. And really, like that that has just lasted, you know, for the decades. And the golden era really then for the LP, the actual vinyl, was definitely mid 60s into late 70s. That was when it was at its absolute peak. And as you kind of touched on it, Frank, you know, no one, you didn't really have much more of an option. Uh, so it was just, you know, you bought your, your, uh, your albums on vinyl and really it kind of it, it, it was top dog you know for the format for quite some time but then quietly in the background you had Philips squirreling away in Belgium uh, in the kind of late 50s early 60s and in 1962 Philips introduced the cassette uh, the cassette tape so now an interesting thing about this was that the cassette tape was never intended for releasing uh, recorded music you know like an album Um, or an EP or whatever, you know, it it wasn't. It was originally invented as a dictating device, you know, or a dictating medium. So if you were in an office and you wanted to record a meeting or something, or if you were in university, you're a lecturer, or if you're a very wealthy student at the time and you wanted to record your notes or study, that was the role of cassette. It was probably a happy accident or byproduct that it became a format synonymous then with with, uh, albums, you know. And, you know, it... (laughs) It did give the vinyl stiff competition, you know, especially in the 70s and into the 80s, because, you know, if we look, if we if we break down um, the tape, like, you know, it was more portable, obviously, you know, that that was a big plus. Um, You had the classic Walkman, obviously, you could bring it around. You can't do that on LP. Massive benefit. You could fast forward, you know, you could rewind. You could stop and you could pause and you could play at the touch of a button. Now, some of the very high-end vinyl players, you could do that, especially towards the late 70s and early 80s, but, you know. And also, you could easily home record. You know, you could record a broadcast off the radio, or then if you had a fancy tape deck, a separate, you know, you could put a mic in and start recording yourself. And like that, now you just could not get that with a vinyl. So that that, that was the attraction. Of course, the mixtape. Jesus, you know, I know we, we're probably the last generation to kind of know the mixtape. Now, I know, obviously, it's making a resurgence, you know, and it's it's hip and it's niche and uh, it's nostalgic. So um, cassette is making a bit of a comeback. But vinyl and cassette, you know, they kind of 
I suppose for practicality's sake, tape kind of won out, you know, but in terms of sales, vinyl was still very steady for a long time, way into the 70s, because, you know, it was the format of choice for an album, you know, it really was. And just fidelity wise, if you're anyway into music, you're not going to bloody buy a tape and not buy the equivalent vinyl. You know, you're just not. It's not a good quality. Like Again, we'll roll on a bit into the mid 70s. And who is it again? Only Phillips. Squirreling away again. You know, no, they can't be. Are they? Yes. The CD also came from Phillips in conjunction with uh, Sony, actually. Uh, They partnered up with Sony. Basically, there's a period between, I think it was 1974, all the way up to 1982, where both Phillips and Sony were kind of, you know, back and forth with ideas of the compact disc, uh, what what it should be, how, how, you know, the size of it, should it rival the vinyl, should it be the same size of a vinyl, like the later laser discs, you know, should it be uh, the standard format across, you know, or should there be various, you know, like the 45s and the 33s, like 12 inch. So in 1982, they went public with the CD and it's exactly what we know today. It's the 120 millimeter diameter, you know, it's the uh, classic uh, aluminium layer where it's, uh, you know, you have your reflection. The big, big difference here now with CD compared to the other two. So vinyl and tape are obviously analog, in, in, absolute analog in nature. Uh, we all hear analog, you know, in the 60s and 70s, it was all recording analog, where it's, you know, you're dealing with raw, raw waveforms and you're etching them on or uh, printing them on nearly like a photocopy onto tape. But with the CD, you had the introduction of digital, you know, you had actual digital bits of music, actual, they're called pits, uh, pits of uh, bits, basically, uh, etched onto the polycarbonate plastic layer on a CD. And they're essentially bits that we would know now, you know, or kilobits. This was absolutely revolutionary, not just the digital format and all that and how it's produced and it was smaller and all that, but the biggest thing for people, I think, when, when it initially came out anyway with a CD was that, you could skip directly to songs. And I think this was the start of what you were touching on there, Frank, uh, in your intro. This was the start of people starting to focus a little bit more on songs and singles, I think. And singles were always around, obviously, but you see it there in the 80s into the 90s, like singles became king. And I think that was it was to do with the, the prevalence of the CD. Well, now, it's, it's, I'll stop you there. Possibly, the obviously, yeah. the prevalence of MTV. In conjunction, of course, in conjunction of course. with the CD. That's it. Like, and it, they pretty much coincide together, mm. you know, uh, the CD and MTV and the whole audiovisual experience, you know, mm. very digital, you know, uh, <laughs> realm. Uh, but the CD itself, I mean, you can kind of look at by 2007, really. That was when CD reached its absolute zenith when we were kind of doing our leave insert around that time. A kind of global rough figure was about 200 billion CDs were sold by 2007. You know, that's a, that, that, that's the total. That's not just 2007. That'd be insane. But then we see quite a sharp drop, you know, in 2008. But, but when I say, you know, quite sharp, like it's by nearly 10 million a year since 2008, right up to now, right up to 2021. It's on average 10 million a year less cds are sold so there's kind of two reasons for this the first is obviously the introduction of the mp3 so uh just a very brief format uh, history on the format of that because i know i think shane will be on about uh, a little bit more detail with digital files so the mp3 or formerly known as the mpeg1 audio layer 3 (laughs) it's uh, it's basically a form of digital audio encoding uh, it's lossy you know so it, it, it's a very compressed format but what i find, find very interesting with this is that like i had noticed now you, you probably knew it lads because you're you're a background with sound engineering in college and that but the encoding of an mp3 when they came up with it uh, in the fraunhofer institute ever since 1987 they were working on this mm. but it didn't really become big until 2000 but I didn't know that they actually used this model called the psychoacoustic model to essentially what, what they would do is like they, they, they kind of take a completely uncompressed CD, let's say, and they would use the psychoacoustic model to basically trim out or take out frequencies that the human ear probably wouldn't be able to hear. Yeah. Um, you can always hear that the most obvious part of an MP3 is that when you hear symbols hit, listen to hmm. um, In Bloom by nirvana that because it's the very heavy hi-hat sound they're really up on the highest frequency like just ar- artifacts of it and yeah with an mp3 you can really hear that that's just 
forced out and you can hear yeah, where it's, it's yeah. trying to be heard and your ear is almost trying to compensate it for it because your ear knows what a hi-hat sounds like so it's compensating for these frequencies that don't exist there and yeah that's the, the main giveaway if you put headphones on and go this is an mp3 because you can hear symbols yeah. Because it's cutting out that low end. Yeah. And then obviously the bottom end. You're not going to get a big mad bass track with an MP3. Like. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Like basically it's all about the bit rate where MP3 throws away content to reduce the file size. Something like FLAC is lossless, so it just compresses it like a zip file. The higher the bit rate, the more accurate the signal is measured. That has the direct impact so on quality of sound. Exactly as Frank said there, lower bit rate can translate to softer bass response, weaker sounding drum cymbals, and it can blur the attack and decay of like plucked guitar strings. So those are the things you'd hear when you're hearing an MP3. Yeah, because um, like that's perfect, absolutely perfect insight there. Because apparently, um, this uh, Fraunhofer Institute—I'm uh, probably not pronouncing that right—but uh, that they had all the rights and patents on the MP3 since 1987. But they do actually revoke it at, at very recently in, in recent history, and I'll get to that in a minute. But basically, the the use of the psychoacoustic model back then it was it was very crude, it was very primitive in its infancy you know, by taking away frequencies that were perceived that the human couldn't hear. So obviously we could, you know, you just, you guys just pointed out there perfect examples, you know, symbols and it's as a teen spirit. And it is, it's very obvious to us, it's an MP3. So it was a very crude way of using that psychoacoustic model, you know, to trim it basically. And just just to tell you, like just about the, the bits there, Shane, you're on about like the mm. kilobits per second, you know, yeah. like KBPS, a CD, uh, I mean, a, a, a complete uncompressed CD, not an MP3 CD. I'll go into that in a while. <laughs> yeah. But um, a proper uncompressed CD is 1,411 kilobits per second. Yeah. The highest an MP3 can realize is 320 kilobits per second. You know, like that's a fucking massive difference. You stark, know? stark difference. Isn't it? Mm. CDs are king, um, man. They're king. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cold, sterile, digital. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so anyway, so the MP3, obviously the benefits were massive. Uh, you, you you no longer needed, you, you, you didn't have to buy your album in this physical format anymore, be it vinyl, CD or tape. You could download it onto an MP3 player or, you know, Apple iPod, you know, whatever. Extremely, extremely portable. And the file storage of an MP3 was minuscule as well, you mm -hmm. know, like a couple of meg for a song. Like, And also, oh, another, you know, little fact that would appeal, especially to the days we live in now, is very environmentally friendly. <laughs> it's very True. little to, to uh, produce an MP3 in terms of physical. Now I know you can go down to chemicals and precious metals involved in uh, batteries, computers, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I remember so, being slagged, sorry there, Ian, just to, yeah. when you're talking about this, how small MP3s were. Getting my first MP3 player and stuff like that, I just, people were like, how many songs have you got on it? Or how many albums have you got on it? And I was like, I think I only had something like, 12 songs because i'd put like wavs on them basically <laughs> yeah. and i was a laughing stock of like all my friends and stuff like that they were like you fucking idiot if you just use mp3 you can have like a million songs on oh, it. oh here and i've ever yeah. li i i listened to the hair he their headphones that they'd listen to like is that supposed is that tool i can't fuck jesus christ it sounds horrendous <laughs> <laughs> uh oh sure but, uh, you know alac mm -hmm. apple also like that's all I had. Like I had the you remember the iPod Classic, the hundred and sixty gigabyte one. Oh yeah, mm. I had that full of ALAC, you know. And again, yeah, people thought like, oh, you only have you know twenty, thirty albums on it. Like what the hell? It you was, know, <laughs> it, was, it was there was a competition there for a while of like swinging your big dick around of who had the most tracks <laughs> on their every tree. It's like yeah. basically who had the lowest quality music possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's it's it's funny. Um, I was just like thinking there when you were saying at the start, Frank of. Uh, we've the unique perspective that we, the three of us, have gone through different stages in our lives where we listen to music in different formats. So, like, if 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 the cassette tape was our, because I remember first time listening to music myself on headphones was the cassette tape. So that's like baby food and mashed potatoes and mushy peas. And then when we got CD, it was better for you more hearty food like meat and potatoes and veg and just something good for you and then mp3 is like fast food 
you know <laughs> you know you shouldn't Quick keep fix. you know you shouldn't keep consuming it because it's going to be bad for you but you just can't stop you know <laughs> that's basically it <laughs> it's, it's, it's convenient and it's there yeah. oh that's it that, that sums up a bloody mp3 yeah but um but yeah so like i mean as i just i kind of said there a few minutes ago that you know 2000 you know it was kind of when mp3 came on on stream it wasn't on stream it was for download but mm-hmm. anyway <laughs> god it's terrible isn't it? a little known fact apologies if you do know it lads but a little known fact in 1999 slash 2000 you know with the release of the mp3 as we know it you know the the uh, layer three one so pop what's the first to distribute their music as mp3s online i didn't know that that's pretty good yeah. who was it do you know Is it the artist yeah Oh, they, they went to bed digitizing their entire uh, oh, it, was, it was everything like it wasn't like it was everything they released the mud honey thing okay that's pretty good no no they they, they squirreled away doing their entire bad catalog very good yeah yeah well yeah it's cool like you know it's nice to see them embrace it but um i mentioned that the fraunhofer institute had the the patent on mp3 right which meant everything that went into it, the psychoacoustic model, the settings they used, all that stuff, right? In April 2017, they announced that they are terminating their licensing and their patent rights on MP3. That's huge. So that is massive. 2017, April 2017. Now, obviously, we know the reason. You know, it's streaming. You know, it, it is the 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 the, word, the age of streaming. But is it? Is it just streaming? I'll say that more in a minute. But... <laughs> I, I just just reading this article about the that that kind of revoking of the of the patent or or the, the license I should say not patent that still exists. So basically, it now means that any sort of developer with a background in digital audio formats they can now take the MP3 and they can build on it, they can improve it, they can go back and revisit that psychoacoustic model and refine it. So, is it the MP3 at the end of MP3? Maybe not. Well, that's it's the whole thing with streaming sites what the hell are we actually streaming? You know, you just go into Spotify and you press play on something. Yeah. Like, is it an MP3? Is it a WAV? Is it a FLAC? You know, that's, I don't think anyone even knows anymore. Um, Spotify and Pandora typically use a bit rate of 160 kilobytes per second, which is less than that of MP3, as Ian was pointing out there. And if you play for Spotify Premium, uh, you'll still only have access to double that, 320. Which is the highest MP3 which, rate. Which is just the equivalent of MP3. Mm-hmm. So whatever you put into it, that's what they're, whatever the artist puts into it, that's what they're pushing out of it. Obviously, yeah, it's, I knew it was MP3 or something quite low quality, but I always laugh at, because it used to always be like, oh, I'm listening to my MP3 player. Now people don't know anymore. It's like they're just listening to Spotify. So they don't mm-hmm. know what they're actually listening to or what quality it is. But yet yeah. they'll go and buy these really expensive headphones yeah yeah <laughs> like, it's, it's laughable like. yeah. Yeah. it's literally like getting a really expensive set of headphones and plugging it into dog shit like it's yeah it actually makes no sense like <laughs> what, what really annoyed the hell out of me right do you remember do you know the way spotify has like three different tiers of quality mm. like normal high and very high mm. yeah and, and you you touched it there shane about 320 being the highest you know yeah i remember when that was brought out that whole it was actually wasn't it called extreme before yeah. very high yeah. yeah i remember extreme yeah yeah i remember reading various articles in that that it was like oh you know as good as a cd but when you dig into it do you know they actually meant the last incarnation of a cd an mp3 cd yeah yeah so it wasn't so, there it wasn't the actual uncompressed uh fucking 650 megabyte size cd it's the mp3 shitty one that someone would burn at home <laughs> so actually on that point as well Tidal is the only streaming website that streams at cd quality for our listeners to know i'm not that's not an ad for title though mm-hmm. just saying <laughs> i am really glad you brought that up shane because mm-hmm. that ties in nicely, real nice to where we're currently at and what is the future. So I'll just I just have a few words on it. Okay. And then we can we can debate and opinions and our, our hearts content. So yeah, you're 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 so correct, Shane. The title has had this niche for quite some time, you know, a good few years now. The two other big players are arguably the two biggest, you know, because I don't think title has much of a share these days, but uh Spotify and Apple. I've literally announced w- between weeks of each other, Spotify is bringing out a thing called Spotify Hi-Fi, where 
you'll basically have a fourth tier called Hi-Fi. And I think you'll 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 also pay extras, excuse me, as well. That is meant to realize the 1,411 kilobytes per second of a CD. Obviously, a big caveat comes with it. You definitely cannot listen to it through Bluetooth because Bluetooth has a uh, terrible compression. So you'll have to listen to it with aux cable or a sound system. And then weeks later, uh, Apple Music announced that they are bringing out a thing called uh, spatial audio along with their high definition or uh, their, I think they're also quite unoriginally calling it Apple Hi-Fi. They are saying that, oh, well, our basic uh, package will be the 1,411 CD quality. And then they have two other packages that go higher than that, much higher, you know. And then they have a spatial audio thing that they're introducing where it's meant to completely envelop, you you know, like a 3D thing. Uh, You can can clearly see where the trend's going, can't you? That like you have people who appreciate their music now. There's audio files out there. And just have one last thing to say just on the the rise of vinyl. And then we can can get into looking at streaming in depth. But... Because it, it, this just kind of, I think, highlights why Spotify and Apple are going down this route of the kind of audiophile level, you know, or, or audiophile grade, I should say. For the first time in 35 years, as of this year, vinyl has surpassed CD in sales, um, according to the latest end-of-year report made by the Recording Industry Association of America, the RIAA, which is phenomenal. The first, like The last time was 1986. That <laughs> that final, uh, you know, add more of a market share than CD. So I think that really speaks vibes to what people want in their music now. I know, I know. We are the audiophiles. We appreciate what vinyl is in terms of the high fidelity, the analog, you know, the waveform, having it on a good quality turntable, getting that enjoyment out of it, of actual high quality audio. But there is quite a large cohort out there of I don't, I hate calling myself millennial, but uh, younger millennials, let's say, Frank and Shay, it's the, you know, they like the whole kind of appeal of it. it it's it's a kind of retro thing. It's nostalgic. It's collectible. And you know yourself. What? It's collectible. It's collectible, but you know, like they're going to have a plane on shitty, I won't name, mention any brands, but they're going to play it on shitty turntables, Argos. you know, that are, yeah, uh, you know, crappy little plastic components, you know, that'll last jig time. And they're, I don't think they're really getting what we're getting out of vinyl. Do you know what I mean? No, they're the ones ruining the environment. That's why we need HD vinyl to come in. We yes, need, we, exactly. need, we, we need Gunther Leibel and the boys um, <laughs> to bring in a more sustainable one. Especially if the, if, the, if the sales are up that much. Genuinely, it needs to slot in somewhere and be a bit less, less toxic, I suppose, to make it. Yeah, but, completely. Yeah. But yeah, I think I think the but, rise in it in this last year has definitely got something to do with lockdown and people being at home more. Well, that's it. Like, you know, people like they have more time to actually sit down and enjoy music now, you know, mm. to just reconfigure their houses and stuff like that. I think just like, yeah, like but, I have listened yeah. to compared to when I was going to and from work on a bus. I listen to Spotify way, way less. Exactly. But as well as what Frank is saying there about collecting, like if you're at home, you're not commuting to work, you're saving money, you go, I'm going to finally start that vinyl collection I've always talked about. or I'm finally going to buy that good vinyl player that I've always wanted to get. So that's probably contributing as much as well that people like to collect. Oh, absolutely. Completely. Mm-hmm. That the, the actual rise itself is like 30 percent between 2019 and 2020. Record sales like that is just phenomenal. Like that, that that's what the pandemic does, you know. But also during um, lockdown, obviously I'm in my own little echo chamber, social media algorithm, and stuff like that. But it's 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 really been pushed since lockdown has started. Like online golden discs are going balls to the wall with advertising their two for forty and stuff like that. So yeah, I think it's definitely because everyone's inside looking at their phones all day, so it's very mm. easy to market to people. So I think vinyl has took the bull by the horns in that regard because it's cool oh, once again everyone everyone it is it's forever going to be cool yeah but um i just think it's really interesting that the the big streaming players are responding you know by bringing out their high fidelity uh stream rates you know i think um just going back to what you said there i think apple's marketing team missed a trick when they called it apple hi-fi yeah they should have called it i-fi but then everyone <laughs> <laughs> but, but then everyone would have sounded like cockneys 
Eye for eye. Eye for eye. Eye fidelity. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, yeah, that's kind of my whirlwind of formats, lads. Yeah, I I have a bit on just how how artists took to streaming because there's technology and there's business and there's economics and there's all these sorts of things. As you said, war brings on advancements in technology and obviously advancements in technology influenced art when you have bands like the Beatles and how, you know, advancements in technology made for electronic music and different genres and stuff like that also then with streaming you've got how artists reacted to it and i think one of the reasons it took so much momentum is that any actual artist who was you could call himself a self-respecting artist first saw streaming as this is it we can finally own everything ourselves we can connect directly to the fans we don't need this distributor anymore we don't need a man to put a disc into a plastic box and send it around the world for us there's this ether real thing floating around us here that we can just connect directly with the fans i think that excited a lot of big artists at the time they were like we're going to set up websites and we're going to put our albums on our websites and stuff like that but just like i have a little bit here just on napster and stuff like that like napster being the first peer-to-peer file share and mp3 site and just a, a bit on that it's dapster is the fastest growing business ever in the world it only existed from june 99 until september september 2001 and within that time at its peak it had 80 million global users no wow. business has ever ever done that and probably ever will do that Jeez. which just shows people's obsession with music like that's file sharing existed from the early 90s file share and faxing and doing all these sorts of things but as soon as music got thrown into the equation we just went fucking mental for it like on the camp college campuses in america they had to like block napster and stuff like that because it was actually slowing down everything with the traffic like everything on the campus got <laughs> slowed down because everyone was using naps all the students were using napster yeah at its peak as well 61 percent of all online traffic was mp3 file sharing in the early nineties, phenomenal, isn't it? Sixty-three percent or sixty-one percent of all internet traffic. <laughs> that is phenomenal. The rest was probably porn. Like that's yeah. that's insane. Uh, like, I, I, was, I was going to say the rest was the viruses that you'd get as well trying to download the music. <laughs> yeah, well, that's yeah, geez. the Trojan horse. The yeah. kind of bizarre thing about it, which I think is just great, it shows the what humans are. And that, you know, all all press is good press. It actually had not that many, like 20 million users globally. But as soon as Metallica took them to court, it skyrocketed because it was the best mm. press ever for it. People were like, who? The Metallica bringing who to court? Oh, Napster, this is amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it wasn't until the court case went through and, you know, the Recording Industry Association of America, the or. IAA, as Ian mentioned there, they eventually brought him to court for, you know, unlawful distribution of copyrighted material. Yeah. And um, they did get shut down. And in that time, you know, you had LimeWire, BitTorrent, FrostWire, I think, and Pirate Bay all got set up. So it was, it took over the world there for a short amount of time. And then it wasn't until um, Apple, iTunes came along in 2003, provided a safe space. It was 99 cent per song, which, you know, oh, Christ, 99 cent. But it was finally safe. It was no malware, no viruses, and all this crap coming along with it. But what people loved about LimeWire, because me personally, I was a big LimeWire user, was that you were getting weird stuff. And that's what the founder of Napster actually said. He was like, the reason I set it up wasn't to stream Metallica's new album. It was for fans to get like the weird outtakes and stuff that you can't find in a record store. And he said that's where him and his friend Risley came up with the idea was we went down to a record store and all we could find was bands albums. But people had files of bootlegs, which was live stuff and, you know, a weird acoustic version of it and all this sort of stuff. And that's what I loved LimeWire for because I already had the CDs. I already had that. I'd already done the work there and obviously sound quality wise. But I didn't care about this horrible potato recording of 
Nirvana live in some toilet in Portland or something like that. Like that's that's why I that's why I was on LimeWire for this weird shit that you couldn't find anywhere else. Because I, <laughs> I I scoured the bootleg places in Dublin for that anyway, and you get these horrible recordings of them. But yeah, no, it was so good for that, wasn't it? I remember myself, especially with Led Zeppelin stuff. Yeah, like that's you could just type. It was just like gone into a fucking. Willy Wonka's factory you type yeah. any band in and usually you get like you type Nirvana and you get a lot of like Stone Temple Pilot stuff coming up that people are just titled as that because I don't know maybe some people were clueless but then other people were just trying to get their files downloaded more than others or yeah. something like that Nirvana are bigger sellers in certain bands or but it was a weird one it was basically just peer-to-peer file sharing once again then 2005 you've got pandora were the first people to actually do like an algorithm it started basing on users listening habits and then you've got myspace obviously which was the first mm. format that actually bred artists getting famous out of it because that was any joe soap being able to put their music up online you've got like the arctic monkeys lily allen people like that got their big break from that and then yeah that kind of got killed off by facebook and sharing things on Facebook. You could just put videos up and clips of audio. You could share links from other places onto it. And then obviously Spotify comes along. One weird thing I found about with Spotify, actually, is you've got 100 million paid subscribers worldwide. That's 100 million people using Spotify. But you've also got 100 million people using unpaid for free versions of Spotify. Mm. Yeah. So that's that's the same amount of people who are paying for it listening to ads and really low quality audio. God. <laughs> but uh once again that is also just a number of someone who probably signed up by accident from some email or something like that. This <laughs> they then get included. As I was saying, a lot of artists I think saw that as a way of getting around things. Like people like Pearl Jam used to put like every single gig they played up online which our friend Barrett Jones was the mixing engineer for those they uh, actually broke a world record the Guinness Book of Records for releasing 40 albums in one day um, serious which were all on their website but uh, you've got bands then like uh, one case here I have is Weezer Malandroid from 2002 so that was Weezer after kind of falling out with Giffen and just wanted to play music they didn't like that because like, they just released a green album and that hash pipe and Island in the Sun and Geffen were like, Yep, yeah, more of that, more Island in the Sun. And they were like, So Geffen want us to make an album with just Island in the Sun on it and make more videos for Kerrang and MTV two. They didn't really feel like doing this. They were like, What do the fans want to hear? What do our fans want to hear? Do our fans want to hear Island in the Sun again? Because I don't want to write Island in the Sun again. So they decided to self-fund all the recording sessions because they had the money to do it. When they went into the studio, or even before they went into the studio, all the demos that they recorded in their own funded sessions, they put them all up immediately on their website and they let the fans produce the album with them. So oh, That's amazing. Which they thought would be this brilliant experiment, but too many cooks in the kitchen you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what they found the weirdest thing was that they'd, they'd write maybe this pop song and they'd ask the fans how should we mix this or which song is the best here and they found that the fans were just mental the fans were coming out with the weirdest shit possible saying do this mad stuff so songs like if you ever listened to Bad Android, it was an app that I wrote off as soon as it came out I went yeah keep fishing's okay with the Muppets but Jesus the rest of it's unlistenable mm. But I listen back to it. I'm, I'm going to count that as my recommends here. Songs like Slob, Burnt Jam. Yeah, like there's like big metal songs on it as well. Uh, December and stuff like that. They're just bizarre. And they wouldn't have been chosen if they hadn't done it that way. Because Rivers uh, Como actually says, he was like, these were songs that I wasn't going to use at all. They were just demos. But then when I put them to the fans, the fans were like, no, absolutely put that on. That's fucking weird. And it's actually, <laughs> people want weird shit. <laughs> and that's, I think, the beginning of the internet age of, you know, internet democracy of just let, like, let's go for the bizarre rather than the standard of what we're always been told to listen to. But yeah, um, in the end, anyway, because they put all these up online on their website, lots of people download them and then lots of radio stations started playing them. And then uh, Geffen started bringing loads of radio stations to court for playing them. Weezer kept saying, no, it's self-funded. 
but then they were like we own all your music and <sighs> yeah it just started this whole kind of thing of like do we need record labels anymore which now we don't because most people like the likes of us get away with not having a record label but we don't have this, the platform that people like Weezer do we need someone to tell the world that we're here which is what Weezer had in the early days is someone telling the world that they were there other examples obviously then are Radiohead and Rainbows their relationship with the internet has always been quite strained pay what you want on their website my buddy Valentine also is uh how they released their second to held in 26 years after their first one that was released their website immediately crashed they announced it on facebook that you could just buy it off their website uh in any way you wanted it. you could buy it an mp3 you could buy it on cd you could buy it on vinyl yeah it's just the website absolutely crashed and shit itself but they also put it on this is one of the coolest things i've ever heard for audio files they also just put it up for free on youtube on the same day but at 144 p p resolution really so really horrible bad. horrible sounding good god and i i was there i i went onto their website and i was like oh i can't buy it I'll, I'll wait till it comes out next week physically in the shops and then i just went it's all on youtube i'll just listen to it on youtube and i was like oh it sounds so shit i can i've heard it all now but i've like it's like it was like looking at something without my glasses on yeah you know, it's like <laughs> it was like i could see what it kind of looks like but i can't wait to properly see it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah just uh, maybe you want to go get it on vinyl more listening to it in its, it's like a sample stuff. essentially yeah it was great it was like seeing a really pixelated version of it yeah yeah kevin shields basically said when he was asked about it because they completely cut out the middleman they did not release it through any record label. They released it on a website called mbvrecords.com. He said we would have had to have sold 1.5 million through a major label to get anywhere close to the money we got from selling less than half a million. So, Fuck. yeah, that's that's how bands kind of use streaming to take it back for themselves, which is now what we've all done. We've all taken it back for ourselves now. Mm. The platform is there for us to do it. But unfortunately, you still do need the money and the backing of establishment and the man and stuff like that. You can make your own little living there if you sling your hook in the right direction. It's a strange old format that we find ourselves in. Ah. Breathe in and breathe out. Namaste. Welcome, friends, to Jimmy Barry's Mindfulness Centre with me, Jimmy Barry. We are Kerry's first and foremost Mindfulness Centre, and we teach you to slow down racing thoughts, let go of negativity, and calm both your mind and body through guided breathing and a peaceful sipping of pints. Oh, yeah. Learn to peel potatoes, shear sheep, and cut turf. And if you call now, you'll get a free two-for-one voucher and a week's silent retreat, the Kerry way. Charming butter. Well, we hope to see you soon, and don't forget to tell them Jimmy sent you. And breathe in. And breathe out. Ah, namaste. It's funny um, what we've been talking about. Like Ian brought us through there about different audio formats. And it's funny how as technology progressed, it's like the care for quality went down. And I'm just thinking about the visual kind of world. So like as technology progressed with TVs, we'd say, then picture quality has gotten better and better and better. And now you have people that will go out and spend loads of money on ultra high definition TVs. And Frank made me think of that when he said earlier, it's like these people buying these amazing headphones and they're plugging it into a pile of shit like but one one thing that I was uh, looking into when we were t- discussing this was um, the idea of high resolution audio, like Icarus probably flew too close to the sun. In Neil Young's Pono, HRA or high high resolution audio is uh, it's generally generally it refers to 
music files that are a higher uh, sampling frequency and or or bit step rate than that of uh, CD. Like with with CD or well with MP3 more than anything, as we were saying earlier, you can lose out on bits of the song. With HRA, uh, you can listen to one of your favorite recordings in high resolution and that you've might have heard a million times. And then you start to discover little details that you never heard before. So it's the opposite kind of effect to that. In the pursuit of this, Neil Young in 2000, well, probably earlier in 2014, but he announced that he was releasing his new digital media player called Pono, portable digital media player called Pono. And Pono is a uh, Hawaiian for proper. So he's really trying to make it his his intent known that he was trying to get music across properly for in, in the best resolution possible. So their goal was to present songs as they, uh, as they're first heard during the studio recording sessions or as close as possible to that uh, as can be. He released this in 2015 to the public and it was like a Toblerone shaped MP3 player that was like $400 to buy but it was a type of hra it's high resolution audio and in 2017 he was disc discontinued so i like I, the reason i wanted to talk about it or look into it to be honest with with this in mind was that it's like the consumer the normal everyday consumer isn't out there for something this this good people didn't find it as convenient as their mp3 player they couldn't have as much music on it as their mp3 player it cost more than their mp3 player you know it was uh you could only get music for it on the pono website and then you you know if you really wanted to enjoy it you'd have to buy the headphones that were the pono headphones he initially crowdfunded it and started getting a bit of traction there to get this out there but this will tell you how desperate he got at one point. He was looking for backing from the one and only, the big dog, Donald Trump. <laughs> um, so, you know, you've reached. Really? Yeah. That's he, amazing. I, I did not Young, know that. Neil Young went, yeah, he saw financial backing from Donald Trump prior to 2015. So when he was still trying to get it up off the ground. Wow. But, you know, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. When you're going to future president Donald Trump. Neil doesn't mention <laughs> you know. that very often, does he? No, no. No, he doesn't you know, mention that when he's singing songs about impeaching him. <laughs> those <laughs> those pictures of him with Donald Trump must be from that. Because yeah. I've seen him pictures with Donald Trump and I thought, oh my God, did he meet him as president? But it must be from that era, Shane. Yeah, trying yeah. to get the phone up. So it was, the, the, yeah, prior to June 2015 yeah it basically he struggled with funding the whole time it slowed the expansion and it just never really got to the place that it needed to be but i have a little quote here that i wanted to read basically just about this was neil young after he had announced that it was no more and the company was going to dissolve and um everything like that i thought this was very very kind of Good. It's a very long thing that he said, but I've, I've just plucked this out of it. So good sounding music is not a premium. All songs should cost the same, regardless of digital resolution. Like he said, let the people decide what they want to listen to without charging them uh, more for true quality. That way, quality is not an elitist thing. If high resolution costs more, listeners will just choose the cheaper option and never hear the quality. Record companies will ultimately lose more money by not exposing the true beauty of their music to the masses. Remember, all music is created to sound great, and the record labels are the ones deciding to not offer that at the normal price. The magic of music should be presented by the stewards of that music at a normal price. Let listeners decide on the quality that they want to purchase without pricing constraints. So I thought that was, it's very true. If you look at everything that we've talked about so far, it almost always comes down to how much you're willing to spend on like if you're willing to spend more because you're a true audiophile that loves listening to music you're going to buy a load of vinyls and you're going to have a much better system much better speakers a really good amp you know what i mean whereas if you're just every day just wants to listen to it while they're on the commute or going for a jog doesn't really care it's just to fill the void then pay less you know 
but I think he's right in saying everyone should at least have the chance to listen to the highest quality that can possibly be listened to, you know. I wonder, this is what I'm coming to at the end of this and the question I wanted to ask you is, I wonder what will that look like? You know what I mean? Highest quality music? Highest quality, but also portable and something that everyone can enjoy, you know? Uh, I suppose it's, it's what Spotify and Apple are going for there. What Ian was just saying. Mm. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder what, uh, especially what Apple are doing, because they're saying they they can realize higher than CD quality. So what I'm afraid of is that eventually we'll get to the point where, you know, people take this serious, like the sound quality seriously enough that we will get to a point where there is this perfect thing. And the three of us are going to be so old, our ears are going to be fucked. <laughs> and we won't be able to fucking listen to it, you know, because <laughs> every year you get older, that high end starts rolling off and you can't <laughs> hear that fre- frequency spectrum anymore. Uh, it obviously will, like if bandwidth grows every year and, you know, yeah. we get to consume things online that are just better and better quality streaming wise. So yeah, it would just, there, there'd be more space. They'll delete a few old football videos or something <laughs> and there'd be more space online. <laughs> Uh, for, yeah. <laughs> for higher audio. Clear, clear, out, clear uh, out all the old mp3s yeah exactly I'll be, I'll be so angry with orange if they deleted the twins <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah i think as for the future yeah it is just for for people who want it though again because like i think that was a good comparison you were making there between tvs have gotten better uh netflix mm. has gotten better but once again light is faster than sound so people see things you have to put no concentration into seeing something you have to kind of Mm. concentrate on things you hear so with audio a lot of the times like the loudness war is one out over quality so people Mm, just want music to be louder a lot of the time if you look at how pop music is now produced like the most consumed music on earth is just loud and down the center Mm. and will sound good will sound the same banging out of a speaker multiple chain speakers in a nightclub and out of your shitty little phone but mm. you know it's classical music or this like labor intensive mix will have to be through 5.1 or you know through a cinema speaker or, you know something like that whereas people don't really care about that like if people would happily sit down and watch a uh, really high definition film but with crap sound coming out of a yeah. bluetooth <laughs> like uh kidney sort of like pod mm. thing <laughs> people seem to be happy with that as long as it looks crystal clear they don't really give a shit as long as they can hear what the people are saying so yeah i do just think yeah as long as people can hear the melodies and the beat that's all they really care about and you know at the end of the day that's kind of what music is about you know your body understands it before your brain does so if you can hear the melody and the beat go for it but for people who really do want to hear the musicianship and the quality of the production and the mixer and the mastering and stuff like that, we'll we'll always find our little way to wank off in the corner to our audiophile stuff. So, <laughs> well, th- th- this this is what I wanted to say. That's perfect, Frank. You've, you've uh, <laughs> led, led led me on to our, our wanking. Was, that's perfect. Our, sure. our, our musical wanking. Uh, but <laughs> no, because that, I was just going to say that the likes of us. With all these advancements, we aren't left behind because vinyl, you know, like, like obviously we, we, we see those younger millennials, you know, buying vinyl left, right and center. They don't care if it's a, a cheap ass pressing, you know, and very low quality vinyl and terrible uh, lathing process. They don't care about that. But what I do like is that the audiophile collectors like ourselves, they haven't forgotten about us. And the most recent kind of advancements other than our fantastic HD vinyl that I really do look forward to. Yeah, good good man gone through it. Please, please. <laughs> the kind of latest offering. Now, when I say latest, it's been kind of in the process of uh, I think it was 2008. But it's it's kind of like the standard highest, highest quality vinyl you can get now. It's called Clarity Vinyl. Did you ever hear of it? No. So it's basically, so it's the 200 gram vinyl. They have a process where the actual vinyl polymer, the bog standard one that they use, has traces of carbon in it this clarity vinyl extracts the carbon so it won't mess with the stylus it won't uh stylus won't pick up magnetic anomalies with the carbon also um these clarity vinyls they're all in 45 rpm 
so obviously the higher the, the whole physics of the higher revol- revolutions, the higher quality, you know, of uh, music coming out. Yeah, uh, you've literally more space per inch, you know. But yeah, clarity vinyl. That's kind of the latest offering we've had for the last decade or so for us audiophiles. Well, you you have the Radiohead stuff, which are tw- do, yeah. tw- twelve inches played at forty five. Yes, mm. they're yeah, they that, sound... that, that, that's a that's a clarity vinyl. That's two hundred gram. They sound pretty damn forty five. Oh, they're, and and meat puppets, meat puppets too. Mm. That's a, a clarity vinyl as well. Yeah, I think it's it's the only one I have is uh, the the Radiohead ones I have. Yeah, look, I mean, you're always going to have the naysayers like, oh, can you really hear the difference? You know, <laughs> I have fallen victim to a lot of these people, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, Gunther will set them all straight. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Gunther, please, please give us all jobs. <laughs> give us free vinyls. Yeah, just just free vinyl, actually. You know, we'll settle with that. You mm. know? But yeah, I, t- I like that we went through all the the arduous formats i think that's why we appreciate it though that's what i'm saying i do think that's why there is so many people from 1984 to 1994 on spotify because they have such a broad range of music and they know the hardships of it so they really do appreciate music Mm. uh compared to the younger generations might not they're probably getting their music from tiktok or different places or maybe they're just i don't know i don't want to write them off but um I definitely don't think they are as into music as people from that generation. Because as I'm saying, we went through this arduous process of it being hard to get. So now that we see it being so easy to get, we're like, wow, grab it with both hands. Look how easy it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Like like anything, because it took longer and it was harder to get, we appreciate it more. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I I can't see the the younger millennials going out for their clarity vinyls. <laughs> You'll always have the weird ones that end up accidentally in a forum with you know people talking about it and stuff. That's the great thing about the internet is a cross contaminant. It's in some ways like you'll you'll have young guys who are into just fifties music, and you know they'll be the people who start that revolution again to bring that back. Mm. Yeah, sixteen year olds playing skiffle. That's how the world works. Especially how the internet works, anyway. Recent trends in working from home has now shifted government policy towards blended working or remote working full time, possibly spelling the end of working from the office nine to five, Monday to Friday, for good. That's right. The end of lengthy commutes, an hour plus in the car, dead end traffic. An end to those awkward, awkward work pints with overpriced drinks and fancy, trendy cocktail bars and pubs for tourists. It also spells the end of 20 or 40 plus cigarettes a day with colleagues on extended work breaks. Do you miss these things? Do you miss actually being miserable, being exhausted? Sick and tired of feeling relaxed, feeling happy, playing with your children, going on those walks, doing the gardening, all those nice things would drive anyone insane. Here at Right to Exhaustion Ireland, we have now created a virtual reality setup that will bring that exhaustion back to your life. Go in those virtual reality commutes that last two hours long in that dead end traffic. Have those awkward work pints. Smoke until your lungs are rigid and black and spewing out phlegm all over the place. We need to feel exhausted. We need that miserable element in our lives. Bring us back to the equilibrium that we have known for millennia. Right to exhaustion, Ireland. Because sometimes miserable is just exactly the tonic we need. It's time to play, to play a fucking game. Yes it is, a fucking game. And this fucking game is called... A CDC. And welcome back. 
So, lads, would you like to play ACDC? <laughs> <laughs> so it's A C D, comma, C S E E apostrophe. You get it? It's C yeah. D and it's ACDC. And... I don't remember approving this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite loved it anyway. I think I, uh, d- 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 I think I might have given it a smiley face. Yeah. Yeah, it comes up. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. So my game is so D- Discogs. You know Discogs, the um, the online uh, platform where you can buy an array of uh, physical format uh, music formats um, from first pressings to reissues. You name it: CD, vinyl, tape, all that. So they bring out stats at the end of each year, and of their top, you know, fifty or one hundred that were sold and all that stuff. So one that I found really interesting, and it says a lot about formats, is their top 50 most expensive items, 2020. So I've cherry-picked six of them. Uh, now, I do have the most expensive then at the end. Um, but basically, I'll just give you a brief kind of what to expect and what I expect in terms of answers, you know, so you can have it in your head. Um, now, obviously, I'll give you the titles and the dates, so you'll be able to work it out maybe. So you have CD box set. You have LP box set, you have your seven inch single, you have acetate, you have cassette, and you have LP. So if you have them in your minds and try and think of, you know, oh God, what would that be? You know, who would like to go first? Let Frank go first. All right, Frank. Yeah. Okay. So we're starting from, this is the 49th most expensive item, right? So it's David Bowie's five years. 1969 to 1973. It was released in 2015. And now I have to say it's a bootleg. Okay. So it's not official. It's a bootleg. And it's sold for three and a half grand. What format do you think that's sold in? So it was a 2015 release. That has to be the acetates, is it? Sorry, Frank. It was a CD box set. For fucking three grand. Yeah. Three and a half grand. Who? <laughs> I know. This is it. It was a collection of uh, bootlegs, broadcasts. Limited edition? Well, limited in that it was unofficial and there'd be a limited run on it, obviously, yeah. There's some insane, insane uh, guys out there. So, uh, on to Shane, okay. This one is interesting because Frank actually probably would have got this one, but it'll be interesting to see if you'll get it now, Shane, okay. So, in at number 47, 47th most expensive at 3,573, you had Nirvana, Love Buzz, and Big Cheese, 1988. LP box set? Seven inch single. Oh, I thought I thought I would have given away Love Buzz, Big Cheese. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was leaning towards seven inch, and I just thought, I don't know. Uh, moving swiftly on, back to you, Frank, now, okay? This is the 38th most expensive. And this is 3750 it's sold for, right? So it's Led Zeppelin 2, hmm. and it was released in 2008. So it's 2008 release. It's not original. It's, it ju- it's just Led Zeppelin 2. Just Led Zeppelin 2. No frills, no deluxe box or anything. Uh, it, it has to just be the LP. <sighs> you know, I, I could technically give it to you, but it's actually the LP box set. Ah, fuck off. Now, what, so how, so how are they making a box set out of something that was just... <laughs> <laughs> well, remember when I was on the Clarity LPs? Clarity vinyl? Yes. Okay. So it's there's there's four, four, four discs. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. Mm. Uh, they only... So it was actually a... You know the crowds that um, took out on license by the... The record companies, um, they're like small little pressing outfits. Mm. Um, I don't know if these were called actually Clarity Records, it could have been, but um, or no, Classic Records. But anyway, they were basically commissioned to do a Clarity test run of Led Zeppelin 2 for an anniversary. And they only did 20 pressings until it was deemed that, you know, it wasn't viable because it just would have cost too much at the time. They had they had their you know budgets to put elsewhere or whatever. So only twenty of these exist in the world. But now they're made in two thousand eight, but they're from the original tapes and all that. Yeah. So uh yeah. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh this one actually, this next one is really interesting now for Shane, right? Mm. I'd be really interested to see what he thinks of this one. 
This came in at number 22 most expensive, right? 22nd most expensive. So this sold for four and a half grand. And it's by a band called Zero. And the album slash EP is also of the same name, Zero. So again, it's released in 1997. And Zero were essentially Linkin Park before they were known as Linkin Park. Oh, I'm thinking tape. Like, well done. Yeah. You got it. Cassette. Cassette tape, yeah. Yeah. Four and a half grand. Well, some massive Linkin Park nerd would definitely pay pay that, yeah. 22nd highest. 22nd highest, yeah. Four and a half grand. Like, so there's still big fucking numbers to come. Like, <laughs> that's, that's mental, yeah. So now, for you, Frank, we're down to the 15th most expensive. Mm. And not much of a margin now. It's five grand, so 500 dear. And it's the original Star Wars cast with narration by Malachi Throne, the story of The Empire Strikes Back. So this was released in 1983. That just has... after, the, just after the, the trilogy was done. Surely acetate. Yeah, well done. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it was n- never meant to be released to the public. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Five grand That's only. Cool. Only five grand. Only. I would only have said that'd be about grand. 20 bargain, grand. Bargain, lads. Yeah. Bargain. That's cool. Genuinely cheaper than I thought it would be. Genuinely. Mm. Now, Shane, this is the big ticket item. This is the most expensive item sold in Discogs in 2020, okay? I'm getting myself psyched up. Go on. Now, you can do this as a joint effort, lads, now, if you want, okay? It's by an artist called Scaramanga Silk, and the album, uh, or sorry, EP, was called Choose Your Weapon. It was a 2008 release. 41,095. Oh, and sorry, 89 cent as well. <laughs> Phenomenal money. Choose Your Weapon is sticking out to me. I feel like I've heard that before. But I, I'm going to go final CD combo. Well done, Shane. Oh, yeah. you, know, you know what that was, Ian? That was Process of Elimination. Process of Elimination. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, really mad story to that one. So Scaramanga Silk is essentially a completely unknown DJ, British DJ. Mm-hmm. Uh, and very, very cult following, you know, like I mean, like, you know, probably Elephant Dream level, you know. Oh. <laughs> and, or, or even less. And uh, he just had, he had like, like he released this back in 2008, didn't think I had an album, very limited pressing, but he's no, nowhere near like fucking Fat Boy Slim or anything like that. But yeah, he, he got a phone call uh, last year from Discogs saying that uh, his item was the the, the most uh, most expensive item sold. And like he, he actually thought it was a joke. He thought it was one of his mates ringing up. Uh, to <laughs> That's this. mental. That's absolutely mental. So um, that was AC, ACDC, lads. Did you I, enjoy that? I get <laughs> it. It, it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to even think about it there. ACDC. It's yeah. It sounds like a dyslexic person saying it, ACDC. Yeah, it's you ACDC. Know. Yeah. <laughs> did you enjoy it, lads? I did. I did. Fantastic. Yeah. Thoroughly. I think it was a draw in the end. It wasn't yeah. you won. It was two one. I'd say you're gutted, Frank. Oh, I had no price. Yes, I told you you'd won, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Shane was like, oh, I'm happy with a draw. <laughs> I, I handed you the fucking win and then you rub it in my face. <laughs> yeah. The future. The future. The future. The future. Is now. Is now. Is now. Is now. Is now. The past. Is the future. The present is the past. Unless it's the future, which is now, which could be the past, which is also the future. It's also the future. Or is it the or is it the past? What what's this ad about? It just has the past as the present, and the present as the future. The 
future is the present, and the present is the past, just written over and over again. It's over and 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 over again. And somebody has this weird echo in my ear. Is this supposed to be an ad for a bank or a car or a fucking? I just give up. The Elephant Room recommends. And welcome back. This is our final segment of the show. And it is a recurring segment of The Elephant Room recommends. I'll start us off. Mine is, I've already mentioned it. Uh, my recommends is Weezer's 2002 album, Malandroit. Can't even say it properly. It's a weird word. It actually, do you know what that word means? Enlighten us. It means clumsy or inefficient. And... Mm going back to how we originally spoke about it it was actually one of the people on the message boards came up with it a user whose name was Lath L-A-T-H-E and <laughs> um, kind of kind of matches in um, yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah just he just uh, the band asked people to put up suggestions for titles and they chose his um, so yeah it was very a collaborative situation between band and fans for a band that were kind of got a bit disillusioned with their mtv fame uh in 2002 but uh yeah once again i i'd kind of written it off when it came out and i just always had it in my head that i didn't like it going forward every time i saw the album cover i was like yeah i don't like that album and and then because i read about it just this week i listened to it in full and i was like it's actually fucking really bizarre it's like pinkerton number two like pinkerton is obviously their kind of most regaled album nowadays after the the whole blue of them is boiled over and especially now no one really knows what the hell is going on with Weezer they're massively famous but they're making horrendously bad music doesn't <laughs> it doesn't make any sense <laughs> but yeah it's 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 a really bizarre album and there's now knowing the story of how it was made with the fans telling them kind of what works and what doesn't work it kind of fills in why it's so lopsided and doesn't have any kind of direction it kind of shows why you do need a, a producer and a band to take control of a situation because if you let your fans tell you what doesn't doesn't work it can just be absolute madness because nobody really knows what they want but yeah slob is a strange song american gigolo the first song is really catchy but yeah just once again it's weezer just being weird um <laughs> And yeah, Keep Fishing, which is a great song, which had the video with the, the Muppets in it and stuff. So yeah, it's actually, it's the usual, very poppy, but like really heavy guitar riffs on it. Like there's some really metal riffs on it. I think that shows that everyone at the time, because it was fans putting their suggestions in, everyone at the time was really into like corn and shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if you were to do that now, people would be like, they'd want it to be electronic or something. Yeah, it's definitely a good representation of 2002, I think. But yeah, that's my recommends. Shane? Yeah, so my recommends uh, this episode is um, a surprise, surprise, a New Zealand artist. But it's not the algorithm. I came across this person just through YouTube. I suppose it's it's not my Spotify algorithm anyway. (laughs) um, That is very much the algorithm. It's pretty much the same. Yeah, it probably is the <laughs> algorithm. Basically, um, Aldous Harding, she's a New Zealand folk singer songwriter, and I've been listening to her album Designer. It's a tw- came out in twenty nineteen, so recent enough, but really cool album. There's some really interesting rhythmic things going on in a lot of the songs, which is not your like straightforward kind of folk. Some really cool drum parts in it. And then there's really good, I really like the instrumentation, a lot of stuff. It's all acoustic, but there's some cool orchestral instruments, brass sections. So there's kind of a pop sensibility to it as well, that there's catchy choruses and things like that, or pre-choruses and stuff that come back. So her album's designer, the songs I would recommend, The Barrel is the song that I came across first. That's a good entry point fixture picture and the song designer off of it uh, of the album designer those are really good places to start she's two other albums that are really good as well cool ian i'm going to give just two mentions uh i'll be brief enough uh one is uh obviously for the the uh, topic at hand formats um i cannot not recommend this 
Uh, so I have to think it's just, you know, it is um, my bloody Valentine's seminal uh, masterpiece, uh, Loveless, the 1991 release, Loveless. So obviously it turns uh, 30 this year and the great uh, founder, Kevin Shields, has treated us all to uh, a deluxe, deluxe. This is the absolute deluxe edition of uh, Loveless, uh, fully analog, end to end from recording to the final product um uh, analog uh, mixed and mastered by or overseen by kevin himself um over the last few years uh basically bought back the the uh, recordings um from the the distribution companies and was busy squirreling away remastering they they were completely taken down from well obviously his decision taken down from uh, spotify and apple and all that he couldn't get them anywhere but uh, now they're back and it's just fantastic um Look, it's shoegaze at its best. The 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 most seminal of work of shoegaze when they invented it, for God's sake. I, I hate I hate analyze or not analyze isolating songs of such an album like that because I mean it has to be listened just continuously. But you know the opener only shallow, you know just shoegaze at its best, uh, followed by Loomer. And um, that that if I'm to isolate songs, Loomer is just it's some some track. Uh, sometimes as well, then you just go on the album. But uh, yeah, look, just unbelievable. Go get it and don't stream it. Get the album. And let me just uh, my final recommends then, just really quickly. Um, it is actually a drummer, um, but I also uh, recommend the band to which he was most famous with or played with, uh, the Dave uh, Brubeck Quartet. So obviously, he's a famous, famous jazz musician of uh, Take Five fame, uh, the Time Out album. Uh, so you're kind of looking at the late 50s into the 60s, all the way up to uh, the early 70s, really. Uh, the drummer, Joe Morello, is a phenomenal, phenomenal jazz drummer. And a lot of people don't notice that he, by the time uh, he kind of finished with Dave Brubeck, you know, the kind of late 60s, early 70s, he was actually clinically blind, declared clinically blind. So he continued to be a phenomenal uh, drummer, like session work and all that right up right up until his death nearly a few years back but he could still play phenomenally even though he was clinically blind but the reason why i recommend him obviously i'm a drummer and i love seeing fantastic drummers um but he was actually a major influence on john bonham and in particular i recommend you to go on youtube joe morello blues for joe or the dave brubeck quartet blues for joe and uh it's phenomenal um, it's it's just a fantastic piece where Joe is featured uh, on a, a just brilliant, brilliant solo. And there's a lot of techniques in there that you'll recognize Bonham, you know, like the hand playing when he gets through the sticks and plays with the hands. Uh, fantastic triplet work. Yeah, just Joe Morello. That's my, my second recommend. Absolutely. It's, it's, you can hear Moby Dick. Like, as soon as I listen to it, I was like, that's it's the Moby Dick solo. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think we're good to wrap up. So, are we? Yeah, I'm happy. I, uh, I really, really enjoyed that, lads. You know, formats. Yeah. Uh, we we do for everybody listening understand our contradiction of giving out about compressed, horrible MP3 formats while doing a podcast that is only available <laughs> through horrible compressed download MP3 formats. <laughs> Obviously, I don't don't think anyone's listening to this on a tape or through vinyl or on cd so yes or you know stream at the very high rate on yeah. spotify and get your mp3 cd quality <laughs> yeah listen on uh, your dolby atmos sound system at home as well yeah but via bluetooth and get horrible compression yeah. <laughs> the Elephant room podcast on 5.1 dolby yeah <laughs> i will leave it there thanks guys 